In this video, we're going to discuss the internal approximation. We're going to see how we can use the value of a function at a finite number of nodes to approximate the value of a function. Let me start with a virtual formulation, possibly coming from a partial differential equation. The virtual formulation we're going to consider is find u in h, which will be a Hilbert space, such that for all v in this Hilbert space h, a u v is equal to l v, where a is a coercive and continuous bilinear form, and l is a continuous linear form, both on this uh, Hilbert space h. Now, we will consider a collection of linear subspaces HH that will be included in our Hilbert space H, but that will be of finite dimension. And dimension will be denoted NH. Now, for now, H does not really have a significance, but later on, we will have H go to zero and NH go to plus infinity. So somehow these spaces NH, I mean this space HH will actually increase, uh, will be including one another possibly, but the dimension of the spaces will go to plus infinity even though each space HH will remain of finite dimension. Let me make a few remarks. The first is that HH endowed with the inner product of the Hilbert space H will be itself a Hilbert space. Actually, it will be a Euclidean space because it will be of finite dimension. Second remark is that A is continuous and coercive on H, or H times H, and therefore it will also be continuous and coercive on HH times HH. Same goes with the linear continuous form L it will be a continuous linear form on HH. Now, let's consider the variational problem, the variational formulation, find UH in HH, such that for all VH in HH, AUHVH equals LVH. So this variational formulation is posed in HH, and we'll call it VFH. What we're saying is, the lemma says that VFH is well posed in HH, which means that there is a unique solution, and that unique solution is continuous with respect to the data. Now, proving this lemma is actually extremely simple. All you have to do is to apply lax milgram which basically is what we discussed in Chapter 4. Now, let me give uh, you a definition, the definition of the rigidity matrix and of a vector BH. But let me first uh, consider a basis of HH. Again, HH is a linear space of finite dimension. So I can consider a basis with a finite number of elements. And the number of elements, obviously, is the dimension of the space, so that's nh. So let me call phi1 to phi nh the basis, I mean, I mean uh, nh vectors, that will be a basis of hh. I will consider, will build uh, a matrix A or ah that will be the bilinear form applied to phi i phi j, and that will be the component of the matrix at line A and column J. Okay, so that will be called the rigidity matrix. Now, rigidity matrix comes from the mechanical engineering, uh, because when you do finite element, elements in, in some specific uh, problems related in, uh, to, to, to mechanical engineering, then this is a matrix that has something to do with the rigidity of the materials. This is why it is called a rigidity matrix, but the, the name rigidity matrix actually uh, is used no matter what the problem is, even if you're dealing with a financial problem, you're dealing with Black and Scholes that we talked about last week, then uh, you still call this matrix the rigidity matrix. Okay, so we have defined this matrix, and I would like to emphasize that when you know A, and A is coming from your variational problem, so obviously you know your variational problem. So when you know A and you know A, and when you know your basis phi i, 
then you know uh, this matrix AH. It's not an unknown, you completely know this matrix. So that is the origin matrix. Again, you know it. You can compute it if you prefer. Uh, the other thing I would like to define is a vector BH, and the vector BH will be simply L applied to the elements of my basis, phi1 to phi and H. Let me make a remark here, which is that A is invertible, it's a non-singular matrix because A is coercive. Also, if A is symmetric, then A is on top of this, is a positive definite matrix. Let me make another remark. Uh, UH, which is uh, obviously the problem, the, the, the solution to my virtual problem VFH, uh, is the element, is, is something that I'm looking for, it's, it's an unknown, but it is an unknown in a, uh, in a linear space of finite dimension. So uh, looking for UH is really the same as looking for its components on the basis uh, phi i. So instead of looking for the vector UH, I can look for the numbers UH1 to UH and H. Right? I mean, I just use a superscript here because, you know, it's a little, cr it's a little crowded, but uh, so basically I'm looking for these numbers, okay, for these NH numbers. Uh, let me rewrite things this way. Uh, UH is basically the sum of the phi i uh, multiplied by the coefficient UHJ, UH, uh, UHI. Um, okay, so what we're looking for again is UH, which is solution to this virtual problem VFH, uh, which means that for all VH in HH, A UH VH is L VH. Now, as we said, looking for UH is the same as looking for uh, the UHI. And let me actually replace the uh, UH by its decomposition on the basis. So I have A applied to UH, which is now written as a sum, uh, with VH equals L VH. But as you know, A is a bilinear form which means that it is, which would, as a consequence, uh, it is a, a linear in its first variable, uh, which means that it's uh, basically the sum of the number a u h i times a phi i v h equals l v h. Okay, but that must be true for all v h in h, h. So it must be true for every element on my basis of my basis. So for all j in 1 and h, then I have this uh, equality. And by the way, if I have this equality, then I can actually recover my, my, my vh. So um, here is what I'm saying is that the sum for i equals 1 to nh of that a phi i phi j multiplied by uhi is equal to l phi j. Okay, but I can write this in a matrix form and I can say that this is the, I mean, basically, it's basically AH, AH, UH, for which I take the, the jth line, and that is equal to L phi J. And that must be true for all J, integers J, in between 1 and NH. So, in other words, what I have is AH, UH equals BH. So, what I'm saying is, that UH is the unique solution to AH UH equals BH, where I know AH, as I said, the rigid matrix is something that I know perfectly and compute it. I know BH, that's also something I can compute, apply L to all the phi i's, and AH is non-singular. So I can solve for UH, which is the unknown, and I will find UH. Okay? So I have a way to find UH. Now there is a question that remains. The question that remains is how do UH and U relate? U is the solution to the virtual formulation, the one I'm looking for. U is really the, 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 is really the, the, the function I'm looking for. UH is a solution to the virtual problem in HH, which is slightly different, obviously. So the question is, uh, how do these two walk together? I mean, is one, I mean, how do they, I mean, what, what is the norm of the difference is a good question. What is the norm of the difference between U and UH?
Let me start with, a, with remarking that for any wh, uh, an element of hh, then uh, here's what I have. uh is an h, so u minus uh is an h, and wh is an h, so u minus uh wh will be an h times h. So I can apply a, and if I apply a to u minus uh wh, well obviously what I will get is a u wh minus a u h wh. But because of VF, the virtual formulation, a u wh will be l of wh. And because of VFH, a of u h wh will also be l of wh. In other words, what I will have is that a u minus u h wh is zero. Okay, so let's keep this, uh, you know, on the back burner for a minute. And let's uh, go back to our problem, which is to find somehow an estimate of the norm uh, of u minus u h in, in, in norm h. Okay, so let's consider our uh, bilinear form a u minus u h u minus u h. And what I know is that a is coercive, so I can bound it below by alpha, which is the co coercivity constant, u minus u h in norm h square. Okay? Now, a of u minus u h u minus u h, uh, well, u minus u h can be written u minus v h plus v h minus u h, right? So, uh, using bilinearity, which implies linearity in the second variable, then that uh, a u minus u h u minus u h can be written a u minus u h u minus v h plus a of u minus u h v h minus u h. Okay, but uh, vh minus uh happens to be in hh. So let's call this wh. Obviously, this term will vanish. So I'm left with alpha, the norm of u minus uh in norm h square, smaller than a u minus uh u minus vh. But now I can apply the continuity of a and say that this will be smaller than m times the norm of u minus uh times u minus vh. And when I do this, well, obviously I'm left with this equation here, this inequality. Now, two things can happen. Either u minus uh is equal to zero, and then we can just open the champagne, or it's not, and I can simplify by u minus uh uh, norm h. And I'm left with this inequality or if you prefer uh, u minus u h h smaller than m over alpha u minus v h h. And let me actually state this lemma here, the CS lemma, which bounds u minus u h h by this uh, right hand side where you can see m and alpha. m is uh, the, 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 the continuity constant, Alpha is the coercivity constant, and then we have this term uh, with the norm of u minus vh in h. Before we keep going, I would like to uh, point out that if a, the course, the, 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 the bilinear form, is symmetric, then we have a little bit more uh, because we can actually define a norm, which will be the square root of that bilinear form. And in this case, we have equivalence between this norm, uh, the norm E, and the norm in the space H. And actually, this is called the energy norm. Uh, it is not necessarily the energy that comes from the physical system, by the way. Uh, but what we have is that in this case, we can actually, um, well, basically, we can use the orthogonal projection and show that rather than, than having m over alpha, we can actually have something that might be better, which is the square root of m over, over alpha. So that is if A is symmetric, but again, if that's not, we, we did not require A to be symmetric, the, 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 lemma, the, the, the CR's lemma works even if A is not symmetric. So really what the CR lemmas provides is an upper bound to the error made when we replace U, which is the solution in H, the one we're looking for, by UH, which is the solution in the finite dimensional space HH, which we know how to compute. And uh, Jean Sea just uh, happens to be the PhD advisor 
of my own PHG advisor. So, uh, you know, this lemma is obviously, you know, very um, touching for me. All right. Okay. So uh, let's uh, just specify that we have uh, several uh, elements in this in this in this upper bound. First, the coercivity constant alpha. Uh, obviously, the larger the coercivity constant, the better. Uh, M, the continuity constant, and obviously the smaller the better. And then how far away you um, you know is from the points of H n. Uh, and obviously, if H n is a very big space then you expect you to be closer to the point of HH because you have so many of them, right? I mean, provided, of course, they are properly uh, distributed and, you know, we, we obviously there are some hypotheses to have, but the idea behind it, the intuition, roughly speaking, the bigger HH is, uh, the smaller that term uh, will be because, the, obviously, you will not be too far away from the point of HH. So this leads to this theorem that will state that uh, if uh, HH is a decreasing uh, sequence of NH dimensional linear subspaces of H, uh, decreasing meaning that basically if K is smaller than H, then HK, I mean HH will be included in HK. Uh, and the limit of NH will go to plus infinity. So really, uh, when, when, when the, the, the dimension of the space will, will go to, to, to plus infinity. We assume there exists a curly H, dense linear subspace of H, uh, and a linear application or H that goes from that curly H to HH, such that for all V in that curly H, the limit of V minus RH V in H is equal to zero when H goes to zero. Uh, so we, we make this hypothesis, we suppose this, and then what happens is that the internal approximation method that we just uh, showed will converge, which means that the limit of u minus uh in norm h will go to zero when h goes to zero. And what we have here is that if we can even say that it goes to zero uh, e, 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 as a, a O of hp, that's a Lando notation, then the method is of order p uh, uh, that is consistent with uh, what we, 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 we defined as order of methods earlier when we talked about ODEs. And finally, I would like to say that Rh is called the interpolation operator.